Okay, let's uh, start with the word of prayer, please. Uh, dear Father, Lord Almighty, I just want to um, thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given to present your word here in the sanctuary to your people. And uh, again, I just thank you for the uh, message that you have given me to, uh, to, you know, to deliver you know, to your people this evening. I truly pray that uh, you'll be with my mouth and um, just uh, say what you would have them to hear this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, as uh, everybody knows, we're in the middle of tax season. So everybody's, everybody's you know, gathering their you know, receipts and whatnot together to decide, to determine whether or not they're, we're going to get a tax return or not, or whether we're going to get a letter in the mail saying, hey, you're going to be audited, you, know, you owe us money. Likewise, you know, you know, those, uh, those of us that are in business, you know, we would probably have done our books already and you know, gone over our accounts to make sure that our business is still profitable and you know, that we can you know, declare and you know, say, yeah, we've had a good year. And we as individuals also need to do an audit of our own life. And the reason why I say that is because when Jesus returns to judge the sinners and the saints, he too is going to go over his books and to, uh, to, you know, to determine how we have lived our lives in his absence. And uh, Revelation 20, verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And Malachi 16 Verse seven and seventeen says, no, Malachi three, verses sixteen and seventeen says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. So as we can see, Jesus is also like us, he's going to settle accounts with us at his return. And the question that Jesus is going to have when he sees each and every one of us is, have we returned him a profit or has, have we returned him a loss? Therefore, the title of my message tonight is God's Profit and Loss Account. As mentioned earlier, most of us here, you know, as I said, are preparing to file for our taxes. And Jesus himself in, you know, commanded that, yes, we should indeed pay our taxes. In Luke 20, verses 21 to 25, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'm just going to read the, you know, the relevant portion. And it, says, it said, render, to, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Therefore, it is lawful for us to, you know, to be in compliance with, you know, with the laws of the land. And even though most of us hate the, the, pro, the fact that we have to pay a large portion of our income in taxes, Jesus said that it is the lawful thing to do. But just as it's lawful to render unto Caesar those things that Caesar demands from us, it is equally and more importantly, more lawful and more important that we render unto God those things that God expects us to render unto him. The Bible says that we should therefore take an account of our own lives and look at ourselves and say, you know, if, if, G, if I was to stand before the Lord today, would I be able to give an account of my life? Would I be happy with what, with what the Lord would find in his books concerning me? 2 Corinthians 13.5 says that we should indeed examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. We should examine ourselves and, and, and see, you know, it, it's easy to say, hey, I'm a Christian. You know, it's easy to say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But what does it really mean to be a Christian? To be a Christian means that we're to be like Christ. And to be like Christ means that we're to do the things that Christ did. 
in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 13, and this is the longest, this is, gonna, this is essentially the foundation of, our, of this uh, uh, study. We read the, uh, the parable of the talents. And I will read all of it because I think you know, that, it, you know, that it really does you know, drive home the point that I'm, you know, that, that I'm trying to make in this study. So if we could turn there, uh, you know, please, I would appreciate it. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a, on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made five other talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reaped where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given and he will have Abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In this parable, we are told that Jesus gave talents to each of his servants. And when he returned, he expected them to have traded with the talents that he gave to them and to return a profit unto him. The first two who settled accounts with him received a reward for their faithful service. The third servant, well, he believed that Jesus wasn't worthy of his service. And because he believed that Jesus wasn't worthy of his service, he decided that he wasn't going to use the talent that he had been given. Instead, he buried it. And therefore, when Jesus came to settle accounts with that servant, Jesus cast him out into outer darkness for his disobedience. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11, and I'm not going to read it, Paul lists nine spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has distributed among the saints. And these gifts are the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healings, miracles, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. In Ephesians 4, 11 verses, uh, 4, verses 11 and 12, Paul gives us a list of ministerial gifts that the Lord has given to the saints. 
and for the purpose and the purpose for which they are to be used. And I will read that portion. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 12. And he himself, meaning the Lord Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. As we can see, these gifts were not given to the saints in order to glorify the saints. You know, we, see, we turn on the TV and we see many of these so-called TV evangelists that claim to have all of these gifts. And really, what are they doing? Are, they, are those gifts being used truly to glorify the Lord or are those gifts being used to glorify themselves? But rather, Paul said, that these gifts are to be used to equip the saints so that they can go out and be profitable unto the Lord. A Christian will often say, and, I, and we hear this all the time, oh, why aren't you serving in the church? Well, I don't know what my gift is. When I discover my gift, then, I, then I'll be sure to use it in the church. Well, here's the problem. We are told that everybody has been given a gift. Remember back in the parable, he said that each of his servants were given gifts according to their ability. It is up to us to discover what our gift is. In Romans 12:3, Paul says, again, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So to say that you don't know what your gift is, is not a reason, at least biblically, is not a reason for you not to serve. Now, many churches, and many of you have heard what they call the 80-20 rule, which means 20% of the church are, are carrying the burden of 80% of, of the service and giving that occurs in the church. Imagine if that rule was flipped over and 80% of the church was doing was doing 100% of the work needed to be done in the church. And we only had 20% that weren't. And maybe among those 20% were maybe the elderly, the handicapped, and the new believers, maybe. How much more efficient do you think our churches would be? Paul said, we have all been given a measure of faith. Each of us have been given a measure of faith according to our individual abilities. And as I said, it is therefore up to us to figure out what that gift is. Now, for those of you who still say, well, you know, as soon as I, I want to serve the Lord, you know, I want to, you know, do my part, but I don't know where the Lord is calling me, or I'm, I'm still praying, I'm still praying over where the Lord would have me to serve, and as soon as the Lord reveals to me where, where I'm to serve, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to, you know, to sign up and serve. Here's what, the, here's what God says in Ecclesiastics 9.10. God says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Essentially what God is saying is, if you don't know your gift, if you're not sure as to exactly what you've been gifted to do, look, at, look around in your, in, in your local church. Find the needs that are in your local church and plug yourself in. Just say, hey, you know what? There's a need here. Sign me up. Let me serve. Now, you may not necessarily be gifted to serve in that ministry. You may not necessarily, in, you know, have a natural desire to serve in that ministry. But that's not what God said. God didn't say that you're to serve once you, once you find a ministry that you enjoy doing. God has called, God this says, serve. Now, if you do, you know, you know, you know if, if, you, if you now, you know, say, well, until 
I know where I'm called, I won't serve, you are effectively burying your talent. You are effectively saying, God, the talent you've given to me, I'm not going to use it until you show me where it can be used. So you are effectively burying your talent, and you are also therefore at risk of becoming like that unprofitable servant. Another thing is, is some people will say, well, I'm not going to serve until I can serve where I feel comfortable serving. I've been called to teach. Therefore, unless I get an opportunity to teach, I'm not going to serve. Or I've been called to, to, to lead worship. And unless, I'm, unless I get an opportunity to do that, I'm not going to serve. Well, I can promise you that if that is your attitude, you will never serve. God will never call you to serve in that particular ministry. And that is because, one, we have to show a humility to serve wherever we are needed. Then God will elevate you to the place where he ultimately has prepared for you to serve. God has prepared something for all of us, much better than what any of us you know, could think. In my wildest dreams, did I, could I ever believe that I'd be standing in, in, you know, standing in for a pastor and teaching on his behalf? No. I mean, I, yeah, of course, I, can, yeah, I, I dreamt it years ago, but did I ever, ever really think it would happen? No. But if I said, I'm not going to serve until I get this opportunity, it would never have happened. You know, I stopped... When, when, I, when I came in, uh, you, you, you came, you came, came in to, to this church about, what, eight years ago now? Eight years ago? And I said, oh, I want to teach. I want to teach. I want to teach. I had a burning desire to teach. And I remember every Sunday, Sean would get up here, and, and he, was, he was leading uh, children's ministry at that time. And every Sunday, Sean would get up here and, 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 and make his uh, weekly appeal for servants in, in the children's ministry. And I remember sitting towards the, back, towards the back of the church and he made, his, he made his weekly appeal, which I always ignored. And then my wife just gives me a nudge, in the, a nudge and says, you want to teach? Here's your opportunity. And that's essentially, you know, that's essentially how, I, you know, you know, how I got started. There was a need in cleaning ministry. Again, no one wanted to do it. We thought, hey, there's a need in the church. Let's fill it. Because I knew, and I was trusting God, that at some point down the road, I will get to the place where I want to be. And now I'm here. And so will each and every one of you get to the place where ultimately God is calling you to serve. We look at the, if, we, um, if, if we look at the Bible, we'll see many examples of this. Remember, Joseph was called to be a ruler. He had two dreams. And that is that, you know, that his brothers and his brothers were going to bow down to him. Then his, then his brothers and his mother and father were going to bow down to him. But that dream didn't come, in, didn't, didn't come to fruition until 13 long years later. Before he became the second in command in, in Egypt... He first had to serve as he first had to be a servant in Potiphar's home. Then, if, then it got worse. He got promoted, you know, to you know, to the head servant in the prison, and then finally, God said, "Okay, now you now you're ready for that position for, that I had prepared for you 13 years prior." Remember, Jesus, you know, we, we, say to, we, we, say, we, call, we say to Jesus, oh, you're the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords. But when he came, he didn't, he didn't come here as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He came as a humble servant. He was willing to humble himself and be subject to, you know, to his earthly parents. Remember, he was found in the temple, preaching, you know, you know, teaching, all, teaching all of the elders. And, he, when, and when his mother came to him and said, hey, we've been searching everywhere for you. 
And he said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He knew what he was called to do at age 12. But if you read, it says, but he went home with them and he was subject to them. In Philippians, Philippians, uh, Philippians 2, you know, verses 5 to, you know, 5 to 11, you can read. It says that he humbled himself even to the point of death. And it was because he was willing to humble himself even to the point of death on the cross that God exalted him to the highest position and gave him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But he didn't get there until he was willing to be the humble servant. And neither will we. And if you're, one, if you're worried that, hey, I've been in the church for several years and no one has discovered my gift, no one has given me an opportunity to, you know, to, to do what, what I know God has called me to do, Proverbs says, a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great men. Your gift, God will cause your gift to be discovered. If not in your church, then he will move you to another church. I... We, we, you know, Bumi and I went to several churches. Several churches. But when we stepped through the doors here, I just said, this is it. This is, this is, where, this is where we belong. And God, has got a, God obviously has proven me right. But if, you're, if, you, if you feel that you're, that you're not growing where you are, then pray about moving, you know, maybe God is getting ready to move you to where you do belong. But don't think that the gift that God has given you will not, you know, will not come to fruition. God, God does not give you, you know, a gift and then not give you the opportunity to use it. Remember, God's promises do not work on our timetable. And, I, and when I'm doing devotion, devotion with my kids, when I'm trying to teach them a, a lesson in, in, in patience, I always use the lesson of Abraham. Abraham was promised Isaac at age 75. Abraham did not have Isaac until he was 99 years old. So therefore, you know, just because you have a gift doesn't mean to say that, you're, that, that gift is going to come to fruition the same, you know, the same time that God, has, God reveals it to you. In Luke, uh, Luke uh, 16, 10, Jesus says that he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. Meaning to say that serve faithfully where you, where, where you can. And even though it's not the, a ministry that you particularly desire to be serving in, Give it your best efforts. Do it as unto the Lord. And ultimately, the Lord will see your faithfulness and re will reward your service. And he will exalt you to the place where he has already prepared for you. No one else is going to step in and take that position from you. Don't feel that, oh, it's a competition. There's, there are limited spots. This is not a company and you're, go and you're trying to, you know, you're all competing for a, you know, for a, for a promotion. And only one of you is going to get it. No. In, God, in, in God's kingdom, each, you know, God has so many positions and he has prepared each person for that position. But here's the thing. There are probably more positions that go unfilled than are filled. Because God can't find enough qualified candidates to fill those positions. David did not become the king of Israel until he went through the school of hard knocks. He was anointed at age 17, but he didn't become king until 30, until he was 30 years old. 13 years of, hard, of, of, of suffering. Jesus did not come into the full, uh, into fullness of his ministry until he was 30 years old. So there is a period of training, there's a period of, of, you know, of this humbling and training that we have to go through in order to enter into that ministry that God has called us to. There is no shortcut. 
It's not like, oh, I'm born again today and I'm, and, and I'm a pastor or I'm an evangelist or I'm a whatever, you know, tomorrow. The Apostle Paul did not become the great Apostle Paul until he, you know, learned, you know, you know what it meant to suffer for Christ. Remember, he spent three years in the wilderness learning and being taught. And then Paul said that, that, that his ministry was to fulfill the suffering of Christ, that that was what his calling was. Right from the word get-go, he was told, you are going to, you're going, you're, you are going to suffer. Your, your ministry is a ministry of suffering. That is what, that is what I'm calling you to. Now imagine getting that kind of a uh, getting that being being given that kind of a, a being commissioned that way. Hey, I'm calling you. I've got this great ministry for you. However, this is you know this is this you know th this is what it entails. And the same thing with Christ. Christ was Christ was you know, was told, hey, this is your destiny. But before you get there, before I can give you that name that's above every name, name before I can you know crown you King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You must first suffer a, a humiliating and you know, you know, you know, death on the cross. You must be spat upon. You have to be slapped, spat upon, mocked, ridiculed, blasphemed. But if you can go through all of that, then I, then I, then I have this great you know, you know, reward waiting for you. As going back to the parable, Two of the servants used the, the talents that they had been given. They went out and they, and they, they used those, the, their gifts to the bit, best of their ability. And they came back and said, and joyfully came back and said, Lord, hey, you gave us you know, these talents, look what we've done with them. And they received, you know, their, you know, they received the reward. Let us not be like that third servant that said, you know what, God? Well, you didn't call, you know, you didn't give me the gift that I wanted. I wanted to be a pastor, but you, you gave me the gift of, 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 you know, of, of, of cleaning, of cleaning the church. I wanted to be a, a, an evangelist. You gave me the ministry, or you gave me, you gave me, you, you gave me the ministry of working, working in the, in, 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 uh, in the children's ministry. Well, God has said, everybody according to his ability. God knows you better than you know yourself. Many people you know, have dis discovered their ministries by accident. They didn't think they were gifted in a particular ministry until they actually tried it out and realized, oh, you know what? I'm, 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 fr I'm, I'm, be I'm being very fruitful here. So therefore, always be willing to serve where a need, where, where, the, where, where the need is. And trust God you know, that to get you to where he wants you to get to. So that you're not like that servant that's going to say, I refuse to serve until, I, until you meet my terms. Until you meet my terms, Lord, I'm sorry, I cannot serve you. Then effectively, what are you doing? Lord, you're unjust. Lord, you're not worthy of my service. And therefore, I'm going to bury the talent that you've given to me. And when, when the Lord returns and we stand before him to give an account of our lives, what are we, what, what are we going to hear? Certainly we're not going to hear, well done, good and faithful servants. Am I saying that we'll be cast out into outer darkness? That's not for me to say. But I, I certainly know that what he will not say, and that is he's not going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. For those who are serving, for those of us who have, you know, who are serving in our in, in our church, for those of us who are, you know, you know, you know, ha are doing the best that they can with the talent that they've been given, Paul says in Philippians two, twelve to fifteen. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Even if you're serving, serve with the right, 
frame of mind. Don't serve as if to say you're serving a slave master. And you're serving, God is not a taskmaster. Because again, you might say, yeah, I'm serving, I'm serving the Lord, I'm serving the Lord, and I'm, you know, I'm, and, you know, I'm, I'm bearing the burden of Christ, and I'm, and I'm carrying my cross, and frowning your face, and looking all somber, and stuff like that. You, there's no reward in that kind of service. There's no reward in it. And what, is it, what does Paul say in verse 14? He said, do all things without complaining and disputing. Don't be somebody that, you know, that, you know like you're working in children's ministry and you know, they, you know, they, 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 you know, leave, they leave a mess. And then, you, then you're, every, week after week after week, you're, you're continually complaining about having to clean up the, you know, the, you know, the kids' room. Or, or you know, you're doing, you're, you're doing, you're in the worship ministry, but they never, they, you know, they, very rarely do they call you to do the lead, you know, to, you know, to be the lead singer, or whatever. And therefore, you're always you know, complaining because you, know, you're, you're, you, you never get your turn in the limelight. Just serve where, you know, to the best of your ability and trust that God will see you and in His time, He will make you beautiful. He will cause your gift to shine. He will cause your gift to make room for you to be where He wants you to be. And if it's not here, then... He will make room for you somewhere else. But he will make room for you. And again, for those of us for those for those who still feel that they you know that they have no real reason or desire, or, or need to serve the Lord, despite everything that has been said. This is what Paul you know, says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, he says, Therefore, we make, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And again, Paul is reminding, reminding us, we are going to stand before Christ's judgment seat. Us as believers. This is not the great white throne judgment. This is the beamer judgment seat. Where, where, we, where we as believers are going to stand before Christ. And this is where we'll receive our crowns. This is where we're going to receive our rewards. For the things that we've done in, in, the service, in, in service to the Lord. And whatever we've done, whether good or bad. You know, we will, be, we will receive a reward or suffer you know, you know, a loss or rebuke for it. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15, Paul, you know, Paul talks a little bit further about what this judgment is going to be about and how we're going to be judged with regards to our service to the Lord. Again, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15, Paul says, For no other foundation can anyone lay that, that, than, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Meaning the, fa all, the foundation of our service to the Lord has to be the Lord himself. Jesus said, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 15, you know, I believe verse 8, he said, without me you can do nothing. We are, you know, if we're going to serve the Lord, then we need to serve in the, in the power that the Lord himself gives unto us. In John chapter 16, in you know, Jesus said that he's going to send you know, the, the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit of truth, he, he will lead and guide us into all truth. He will teach us all things. When, in Luke 24, when Jesus was, was about to be taken back up to heaven after his resurrection, he told the disciples, tarry here in Jerusalem until you've received power from on high and then you'll be able to go out and fulfill the Great Commission. And in Acts you know, chapter 2, verse 4, we see that they received the Holy Spirit. Likewise, we also should serve in the, in the power of the Spirit, not in our own strength, because that is where the, the com disputing and complaining in ministry comes from, because we're not, we're not serving in the Spirit, we're serving in the flesh. And therefore, therefore, when things don't go our way, we start complaining and we start disputing and arguing, and, 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 and therefore the, the, the work of the ministry 
it, it, you know, it, it's, you know, you know, suffers. Verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation, which is, the, which is Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will, be made, will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it, built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Therefore, what Paul is saying there is, is there are two types of service. There's a service done in the spirit, which is, which is you know, gold and silver and precious stones, or there's the service that's done in the flesh, which is wood, hay, and straw. What does it cost you to serve the Lord? If it costs you nothing, then it's wood, hay, and straw. If you're, serving in the, if you're serving for selfish reasons, then it's wood, hay, and straw. If you're serving with, with disputing and complaining and resentment, then it's wood, hay, and straw. But if you're serving truly as God has called you to serve, and you're calling upon the Lord and saying, Lord, give me, you know, fill me with your spirit, as, as, as the song said. You know, fill, me, fill me up, fill me up and that's your prayer, and you're serving in the power of the Spirit, then you're serving, with your building with silver, gold, and precious stones. If you're giving all that you can give, you're serving selflessly, and, selfish, and sel uh, selfishly and sacrificially, then truly you're giving your best. That, then truly you are building on the foundation, which is Christ, with precious stones. With, with silver and gold. You are given everything that you can give and you will re be rewarded accordingly. Therefore, and, and I will close here, you know, let, us, let, you know, let, us, let us serve the Lord with the talent that we've been given. Let us serve the Lord with the talent that we've been given. Let us, you know, you know, let, you know, let us not have that in, you know, let us not be embarrassed on that day when we stand before God. And we don't know when that's going to be. You don't know when your last day on earth is going to be. We all talk about, you know, well, the rapture, the rapture, the rapture. For you, your last day could, you know, could be tomorrow. Because, you know, and, and here's another thing, and, it, and here's a scripture that, that, and that it's not here, but here's a scripture that, you know, that, you know again, that you need to, we need to be careful of. And that is Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, when it talks about, when he's talking about, you know, when he's, when he's, when he's talking about those who, who say, oh, in your name, Lord, we did this. In your name, Lord, we did that. We did this. We did that. But he says, I will turn to them and I will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because they were serving for selfish reasons. They were serving to obtain personal glory. Let us not serve in that vein. And there are many of them that do that. They serve purely for selfish reasons. And that is why Jesus continually blasted the Pharisees because they were serving for their own selfish needs. They, they wanted the glory. They wanted honor. They wanted personal recognition. Rather, let us you know, serve the Lord so that when the Lord returns, he can say, Matthew 25, verse 21, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Let us pray. Dear Father, Lord Almighty, I just again just want to thank you ever so very much for the um, opportunity that you gave to me to deliver this message this evening. And I truly pray, as I prayed earlier before coming, that you would just open up the hearts and minds of the people to receive this message and the Spirit in which it has been delivered. And I again just uh, pray, Father Lord Almighty, that you will bless this church and that you will use this church for the, for the purpose for which you established it. Again, thank you, Nia, thank you for all that you have, are, and I pray you'll continue to do for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.